Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Togoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the origin, insertion, action, and innervation of the four major abdominal muscles. And so we're going to go through step by step the rectus abdominis, the external abdominal oblique, internal abdominal oblique, and then the transverse abdominis. Okay, got these nice pictures right here that pretty well illustrate the origins and insertions, but we're going to talk through them. Okay, so one thing I want to mention about the abdominal muscles, and it's not true for all of them, but for a lot of them, um, the origins and insertions are a little bit ambiguous. Okay, um, Generally, when we talk about most body parts, particularly in the limbs, the origin is defined as the part of the muscle that doesn't move. Okay, It's more static. And the insertion is the part of the muscle that moves or is mobile. And when the muscle contracts, generally the insertion is pulled toward the origin. Okay? Um, now, when you're talking about these, you have to have an origin and you have to have an insertion. But just understand that depending on the nature of the contraction, sometimes the origin can actually move towards the insertion, and sometimes the insertion can move toward the origin. And we're actually going to talk about how that applies here in the rectus abdominis. But this right here is just traditionally uh, the information that we use. And also notice, as we go through this, that the nerve supply to all of these is identical. All right, so rectus abdominis. This is, of course, the washboard muscle that uh, is in the middle of the anterior abdominal wall. It's the most medial of all of these. Hopefully you know what that is from some of the previous videos. So the origin is down here in red. Okay, so here's our origin. The origin of the rectus abdominis is going to be the pubic crest on either side and the pubic symphysis. So really just all the structures down here are the origin. Now, the fibers we tend to talk about move upward toward the insertion, and so these blue things right here are going to be the insertions. So one, we have the xiphoid process. Recall that that's the inferior part of the sternum. Okay. But then also this muscle is going to insert on the costal cartilages of ribs 5 through 7. So this would be rib 5 right here, 6, and 7. Okay. Um, now, again, if we were talking about this traditionally where the insertion is pulled toward the origin, then this would be like the mo motion of a sit-up. So when you do a sit-up, pretty much your pelvis is planted on the floor, and so that means the origin would, of course, not really be moving. And so then when you do the sit-up, you're basically thoracic cavity, all the rib cage, all that, the upper torso comes off the ground, and so the fibers would be pulling downward, pulling the insertion toward the origin, and that lifts your upper body up, thus a sit-up. Okay? But we can also talk about this in the reverse direction. What if you somehow keep your upper torso planted on the ground, and you actually lift your lower body, including your buttocks, off the ground a little bit? So to understand that, I'll show you a quick clip from Rocky IV. I know that's a great clip to use in an educational video. But um, in this video, you can actually see that his upper torso is actually planted on the floor, and it's actually his lower body, his pelvis, that's actually coming up off the ground. And so in this case, it would seem that the origin is moving toward the insertion. Okay, uh, So with the rectus abdominis, um, actually either one of these can be the mobile component, the insertion or the origin. But traditionally speaking, you can look this up in any textbook, the insertion is superior up here and the origin is inferior. Okay. Now the action of the rectus abdominis is really trunk flexion. Now regardless of whether you're doing a sit-up or you're doing that motion that I just showed you in the uh, Rocky IV clip, um, either one of those is a trunk flexion. Okay. Um, the other thing that the rectus abdominis does is it tenses the anterior abdominal wall. So it compresses the, the viscera posterior to it, so in the abdominal cavity, all the organs in there, compresses it and provides support um, so that they don't actually move around, especially during things like heavy lifts or whenever you're carrying a large load. Okay. Uh, now for the nervous innervation, the rectus abdominis is going to be the same as we see for all the other four muscles. It's what we call segmentally innervated because all these muscles span up pretty high. They have a pretty good height. So you have upper fibers up here, middle fibers here, lower fibers here. And so depending on where you are relative to the vertebral column is going to dictate 
where the nerve supply is going to come from. So if you're up here closer to the xiphoid process, the innervation is going to be more T7 and below that T8. But if you're way down at the bottom, it's going to be more of the iliohypogastric nerve. And I'll probably neglect this uh, for all the other muscles and then come back to it at the end because they're all the same. But the nervous supply in general is going to be T7 through T12, and then the iliohypogastric nerve, which basically comes from L1. Okay. Um, T12, also just so you're aware, is known as the subcostal nerve. So sometimes you'll see it written as T7 to T11, subcostal nerve, and then iliohypogastric nerve. So keep in mind, all of these abdominal muscles are segmentally innervated. We actually saw that in the deep muscles of the back as well. All right, now let's talk about the external obliques. So now we're shifting gears and talking about the lateral muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. And of course, the superficial one is the external abdominal oblique. Okay. So again, the origins are here in red. Okay. Uh, we see that the origins are just going to be the external surfaces of ribs 5 down through 12. So here's rib 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then, of course, 11 and 12 are floating ribs. So those are the origins right here. Um, and then the insertions, there's actually several. Uh, one is the linea alba. Now, the linea alba is the midline of the rectus sheath. Okay? All this white tissue right here, recall that this is the aponeurosis of the external oblique that we talked about in one of the previous videos. Recall that the aponeurosis of any one of these three muscles, whether it be the external oblique, internal oblique, or transverse abdominis, all three of those aponeuroses um, move together toward uh, the linea alba, okay? And I went into more detail on that in the rectus sheath video. Now, by the extension of the aponeurosis downward, uh, the external abdominal oblique also inserts on the pubic symphysis, the pubic crest, and then also uh, some of the iliac crest over here, all right? Also notice something about the fibers of the external oblique, okay? As you move medially toward the linea alba, the fibers seem to run inferiorly. The other way to look at this is as you move laterally away from the linea alba, the fibers actually run superiorly. And other than the fact that the external oblique is uh, superficial uh, to the internal oblique, uh, that can actually help you differentiate this muscle from the internal oblique because the internal oblique is going to have fibers that run the opposite direction. Okay. Now, for the actions of the external oblique, it's going to be to flex the trunk and rotate the trunk. Okay, So if we have both external obliques contracted at the same time, uh, then that's going to produce some trunk flexion and assist with the action of the rectus abdominis. Um, generally, if we have one side contract, it's going to produce a trunk rotation. Now, this is the thing about the external oblique, and we'll kind of hint at this again with the internal oblique. The external oblique muscles are what are referred to as contralateral rotators. The internal obliques are ipsilateral rotators. So what that means is for the external oblique being a contralateral rotator, if the right external oblique contracts, so the left one's not contracting, only the right one over here, then you'll actually have net rotation to the left. Okay. Now how does that make sense? Well, if we think about this for a second, um, remember that just because the origin is here and the insertion is here, remember for the abdominal muscles, it doesn't necessarily mean the insertion is pulled toward the origin. We can actually have the origin pulled toward the insertion. Now think about this, okay? We've got this large rectus sheath right here and a relatively mobile rib cage. What's going to be easier to pull? This very dense, tough, uh, aponeurosis right here, which is the rectus sheath, and it's actually fused with the aponeuroses of the other two, okay? or the rib cage, which is actually connected to the spine, which we know can rotate fairly easily. What's going to be easier to rotate? Well, it's actually going to be easier to rotate the ribs and move the ribs, the origin, toward the insertion. Okay? So if I have the right external abdominal oblique contract, if we rotate toward the insertion on this side, that's actually rotating toward the left. So in other words, contraction of the right external oblique causes leftward rotation. Vice versa on the other side, which we can't see, if it were left external oblique, that would actually cause us to rotate toward the right. Okay? And so the external obliques are going to be contralateral rotators. Okay? And one more thing, they're also going to play a role in compressing abdominal contents from the lateral side, uh, just like the rectus abdominis did in the medial aspect. Now for the internal abdominal obliques. 
Okay? I'll go ahead and mention this, so keep it in mind. These were our ipsilateral rotators. That way I remember it, internal eye, ipsilateral eye. Now, for the origin of the internal oblique, that's going to be our stuff here in red. So let's actually start down here. We have, first of all, the anterior iliac crest, also extending downwards to the inguinal ligament right here. But then also it's going to kind of connect on the back side with the thoracolumbar fascia, which we talked about, again, in one of the previous videos. And the insertions here are going to be in blue. So again, we have the linea alba right here on the midline, just by nature that uh, we have this aponeurosis right here that's going to ultimately uh, be fused with the other ones at the linea alba. So that's one insertion. We also have um, a little bit of the pubic crest right here, and then also the inferior surface of ribs 10 through 12. So we actually see rib 10 right here. There's actually a floating rib 11 down there, and I don't believe 12 is actually shown. It might actually be, but it's going to be inferior surfaces of ribs 10 through 12. Okay. Now, in this case, the in internal oblique is going to produce ipsilateral rotation. Okay. Um, so in other words, um, the insertion is actually, in this case, going to be pulled toward the origin. And the reason for that is because, again, the ribs by virtue of being connected to the spine, are actually easier to move than the entire pelvis, okay? So if we pull in this direction, so from the insertion toward the origin, then contraction of the right internal oblique right here is gonna produce rotation to the right, okay? Um, and again, in addition to ipsilateral rotation, these are also going to play a role in compressing the abdominal contents, just like the rectus abdominis and the external oblique. Now, if we had a rotation to the right, think about what that would involve. It would actually involve the right internal oblique, but the left external oblique, which you can't see. If we had rotation to the left, it would be due to left internal oblique and right external oblique, because the externals are contralateral rotators. Okay? The other thing about the internal oblique to note here is, again, notice the direction that the fibers are running. Okay? Um, as you go laterally away from the vertebral column, or I should say the linea alba, the fibers move inferiorly. As you move medially toward the linea alba, the fibers move superiorly. That can actually help you differentiate it from the external oblique if shown in isolation. Now the last muscle here is the transverse abdominis. Okay? Well, let's look at the origins first. We'll start down here. So we've got the iliac crest. We've got the inguinal ligament, which actually goes down here. We have the internal surface of costal cartilages 7 through 12. So you can see those right here. And then moving around the side here toward the back, it will actually originate also on the thoracolumbar fascia. Now the insertion is here in blue. Again, it's going to insert on the linea alba and actually also on the bottom, pubic crest and pubic symphysis, right? Um, now, again, with the transversus abdominis, we talked about its action more um, in one of the previous videos, but notice how the fibers run laterally. They run transversely. That's actually where this gets its name. So whenever this muscle contracts, it really doesn't produce any rotation. Um, it doesn't produce any flexion. And that's because generally the right transverse abdominis contracts at the same time as the left. You don't really have bilateral control of this muscle. It either contracts both at the same time or not at all. Now, with the action of this muscle, okay, this is kind of important to think about. The linea alba right here, we've already said, is not very mobile. We talked about that really with respect to the external and internal obliques. The linea alba is not mobile. On the back side, where the thoracolumbar fascia is, that's also not very mobile. So neither one of those is really going to move at all, which is actually why you don't see for the action any kind of extension or flexion or anything like that or rotation. So there's no really movement like that. So what's going on if neither the origin nor the insertion are mobile? Well, if neither are really mobile and you can track both of these muscles, then that's going to cause compression inward, like a weightlifting belt. And so the action of the transverse abdominis, because neither the insertion nor the origin really move, is you're going to have net inward compression of all the stuff inside the abdominal cavity here. So its only action is really to compress and support the abdominal viscera. Again, we can talk about the IST complex where it stabilizes the spine, but that plays a role, of course, in the compression. Okay. All right, now to bring this all back, again, I want to uh, remind you that 
all four of these muscles have exactly the same innervation. And it has to do with the fact that they're segmentally innervated. So again, depending on where you are relative to the spine is going to dictate uh, what nerves innervate that part of the muscle. Okay? But in general, the nervous innervation is T7 down to T11. And then, of course, T12 is going to be the subcostal nerve. And then the iliohypogastric nerve, which comes from the root L1. All right. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the four major muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.